Hello and welcome to Backstage Buzz, where you get the inside story on upcoming events at the MAC. Later on, I will chat with Daniel Milhouse, the director of the next play from College Theater called The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Night. Then Justin Witte will tell us more about the current exhibition on display at the CCMA by artist Edra Soto. But first, I'm pleased to welcome Jeff Bevington to the show, who is here to share details about the DuPage Pop Art Challenge. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you, thanks for having me. Well, I'm so grateful to you because you inspired this amazing um, Pop Art Challenge that's gonna happen all over DuPage County mm -hmm. um, in honor of our Warhol show. And can you tell everybody about this idea that you had for Glen Ellen? Well, you know, Andy Warhol's famous for a lot of things, um, but one of the most famous things people can generally think of is the quote he had, which is, in the, in the future, we will all be world famous for 15 minutes. And when I heard about the show, I immediately thought about that quote. So I started finding, looking for people that were famous or infamous in Glen Ellen and created the, the artwork that was the beginning of the Pop Art Challenge. So in the Pop Art Challenge, there's four images, mm -hmm. Sean Hayes, Catherine Dunham, mm -hmm. Jeffrey... Jeffrey Deaver. Le Beaver. Deaver. Deaver. And I can't think of the fourth one right in this one. Lori... Lori Anderson. Anderson. Mm -hmm. And they're all from Glen Ellen. Yes. And what made you choose those four? Well, they were all in, um, in media and arts, and so I thought oh. it'd be nice to kind of combine them all together. You know, Sean Hayes is particularly famous, um, but then I wanted to get a kind of a mix of people. You know, mm -hmm. you may or may not know uh, Lori Anderson, and many people don't know Catherine Dunham, but you know, she is incredibly famous in her own right oh, for sure. the work that she does. And Jeffrey Deaver, you know, he's a guy who's famous for words and writing and probably doesn't get much notoriety other than his name on a book, which is good. So I wanted to feature all four people. Well, what's interesting to me, because I knew Sean, Lori, Catherine Dunham, but I didn't mm -hmm. know Jeffrey until you brought him to our attention and you sent me the, the image, and Jeff sent me the image saying, what if we do this mural? And I said, awesome, this is so great. Let me see what we can do. And I looked up Jeffrey and I'm like, he's written hundreds of books, yep. hundreds of bestsellers, published all over the world, and he wrote movies as yep. well. And I think it's funny that he stayed so quiet under the, like why, why doesn't everybody in Glen Ellen know? So what I love is that it's brought attention to that and it's brought mm -hmm. attention back to Catherine Dunham, who's probably the most famous and prolific African-American choreographer in the mm -hmm. country, in the United States. She's won a, a Kennedy Center's award. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course, Sean and Lori have a lot more recent fame, I think, so people know who they are mm -hmm. a little more. So now, yep. when Jeff came up with this idea, I was like, what if we do this all over DuPage County and make it the DuPage Pop Art Challenge, mm -hmm. which is what we're doing. So who are you working on next and for what town? Well, um, I most recently started working on um, Addison and Lyle. You know, Addison, I'm waiting for two more people, but it's interesting. I don't say the name per se, but uh, you know, they have a, a famous um, Olympic athlete. She, she is a, a figure skater, pair skater with her husband, and that's fun. And then there's a guy who's kind of a local TV celebrity in sports. And Lyle is really interesting because, you know, if you look at what I did for Glen Ellen, it's these people that have a higher degree of notoriety in the arts, but in Lyle, it's just really something neat. It is Joy Morton, who is the founder of Morton Salt and oh. Morton Arboretum. Um, a, a woman who I don't know her fame yet, but I'm still kind of working on it. It's a really old, like a tin type picture. And two guys, one guy's a fireman, and the other person is a coach. Now this coach might never have been known outside of Lyle, but I'm sure within Lyle, within everybody he coached and taught, he's incredibly famous and remembered. So, so he's a hometown hero. Yep, hometown hero. I love yeah. that. What I like about this is that it brings attention to Warhol through the, through the, the style. Mm -hmm. I love that it brings the community together through choosing the four people. And 
I, I think it's just, it's great, it's a great way to memorialize people in your town, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it'll be a great, you know, um, Instagrammable moment for, for different towns. But I think a lot of, of them, like, it's interesting that people are finding out who's from where. Right. Like um, Billy Corgan from the Smashing Pumpkins. Glendale Heights, I think. Right, well, mm -hmm. Glen, you know, some people say, oh no, he's from Glen Ellen. And, and we asked Billy, I go, where do you identify? He goes, either one's fine. You know, I loved mm -hmm. them both. Um, but the, there's so many names now floating around. The Belushi brothers, of course, mm -hmm. are, are floating around. Um, Sinise, Gary Sinise. Mm -hmm. But we, we have quite a few really impressive people from DuPage County, Bob Odenkirk. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm excited to see all the different ones that come up. Yeah, and I mean, there are people who are famous in different ways too, like, uh, there's a woman named, young woman named Lucy who's the youngest woman to climb Mount Everest. And I think she's climbed uh, some kind of a feat like all 50 main mountains or something like wow. that. She's from Naperville. Um, and then Stefan Holt, who is a, a newscaster, is also featured from Naperville. Let me see then. There's the gentleman who won Jeopardy, and who now I think is sure. the host of Jeopardy. Uh, forgive me, I'm forgetting their names. And sure, that's So great. there's a lot of really interesting people and like I said about the coach and Lyle, you know, they're, they can be famous or they can be hometown heroes, but it's important. I heard the village of Roselle, which is uh, what, 15 miles north of here, they're really excited about it. I think they are whittled down their choices to 54 right now. And there's- 54? Yeah, 54 people, but they're still working on trying to get only four. And then they're gonna do something to recognize the other 50. But they had an open call and a voting by all the um, people who live in the village to say, I want this person to be featured. Oh, that's so, fun. Yeah. Well, the goal is then by the time the Warhol exhibition opens here at the Cleve Kearney Museum of Art at the MAC, this summer, the summer of 2023 in June, that there is pop art all throughout DuPage County. And I think mm -hmm. Elmer's is doing it. I think there's like mm -hmm. 10 to 15 towns that are on board. And Aurora just yesterday told us they're on, they're oh, doing yeah. it. So it's really exciting to see um, the community throughout all of DuPage County. It's a lot of fun. And I mean, I'm, I don't know how many hours I'm spending on each little portrait, but some more than others, but just staring and looking and thinking, wow, I wonder if this coach ever knew somebody would be doing this to his picture or the firefighter or somebody else. So, and I'm, I'm really anxious to see them up in the communities. Are you doing this all by hand or digitally or how, what's your process? It's mostly digitally. Yeah. You know, I work in Photoshop, but I'm not using any like static filters or anything like that. I'm going in and I am doing some of it by hand. I have a Wacom board with a digital pen. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing a lot of drawing digitally. Awesome. So I kind of bring things out. So kind of a combination of, everything so that because it's pop art you know it needs to be reproducible mm -hmm. everywhere like Andy Warhol's art right. so that's why I'm using a computer primarily. Well I think you're gonna see those turn into t-shirts and all, I think every town's gonna love those. Mm -hmm. Well Jeff thank you for your gift your talent and sharing it with all of DuPage County and we're super excited to see the Warhol Pop Art Challenge all over DuPage County this summer. So am I thank you. Thank you. All right. For more information about the DuPage Pop Art Challenge or the upcoming Andy Warhol exhibit, visit warhol2023.org. Buffalo Theater Ensemble's production of Andy Warhol's Tomato opens February 2nd and runs through March 5th. Don't miss this fictional tale of an unlikely friendship that inspires the beginning of an American icon. Palabolus is turning 50 the innovative dance company is sure to wow Mac audiences when they bring their anniversary show, The Big 5-0, to the Mac on February 5th. World famous comedy company, The Second City, returns to the Mac on February 11th for their show, The Best of the Second City. On February 19th, come see Jazz at Lincoln Center presents Songs We Love, this journey through 40 years of iconic jazz music will include songs made famous by Billie Holiday, Frank Sinatra, and more. For tickets and more information, visit at themac.org, stop by the box office, or call 630-942-4000. Here to tell us more about the next play in College Theater season is the director of the show, Daniel Milhouse. 
Welcome, Daniel. Hello. Hi, Diana. So are we going to let the cat out of the bag of what just happened? Because this is a pretty good story. Oh, that, uh, which cat? The cat. <laughs> or which dog? The big, the big, so he is directing um, The Curious Incident of the Dog of the Night. Yes. And the show's going to open. Uh, March 2nd. March, March 2nd. March 2nd through March 19th. And what happened this weekend? Uh, we had our lead actor, unfortunately, had to drop out of the show. So we had to uh, recast. And that's real live theater. That's real live theater right <laughs> there. Yeah. That's it, what it, happened. I mean, it was a shock. I mean, it, I think I got the email, read it seven o'clock at night on Sunday. And our first rehearsal is yesterday, Monday. And oh. so it was like uh, scrambling now to figure all do? that out. Yeah. But we got uh, we we got someone within the cast to Good. step in. They read it last night. It was Good. their first time reading the script. Uh, I'm hopeful. Uh, he's really excited. He's really fun to work with. He's really engaged and, and awesome. really excited. But you know, that's what that's life in the theater. Yeah. As a director. And things the other, happen. other positive thing was, you know, because we had to shift some things, an actor we couldn't cast, I was able to call up to nice. replace the actor that got moved up and he was also thrilled. Because you know it's it's a puzzle. Casting these shows is a puzzle because you're it dealing is. with actors' conflicts. That's like the biggest issue is dealing with people who are missing weeks at well, a time. Well, and, and somebody might be a phenomenal actor, mm -hmm. but they're too tall or they're too short or they're not the right type or they're... I'm know. glad you brought that up because I think that's a lot our students sometimes miss or even actors, professional actors sure. miss sometimes that it is such a puzzle. Conflicts. How do they look? How do they sound with the other actors? Right. Like uh, we were just talking right before, like, you know, if I had an actor who's 6'5", but his dad is, you know, 4'3", is it's, that going to pull? What's it, We have to ask ourselves. It's distracting. What's going to pull an audience? What's going to distract right. them? Yeah. What's going to best tell the story we're trying to tell? I used to say when I directed, by the time you're done with a, with your final callbacks, mm. in most cases, to me, the show casts itself because the chemistry and the puzzle pieces all fall into place. Yeah. And and sometimes you need a screwdriver and sometimes you need a hammer and sometimes you need some, and, and it's not that you're good or bad or your choice, it's just, I need, this works better with this. And sometimes you can't even explain it outside right. of that. It's just, I, that was it. Yeah. Their, their connection, their chemistry. Uh, you reminded me of Christoph Waltz in an interview talks about how all acting is is casting. You can cast a phenomenal actor, but if you miscast them, in the wrong part, be, forget it. Yeah, it can it's be a terrible mess. experience, yeah. So tell us about the show, so yeah. the story, and what you like about the story. I have to make sure I don't give away any spoilers, okay. right? Okay, Because okay. there's a lot of twists okay. and turns in this one. Uh, but the general story is, uh, it's about Christopher, who's a 15-year-old boy who is uh, on the spectrum. He had, mm -hmm. uh, he's autistic, mm -hmm. uh, and he discovers right at the top of the play a dead dog. A dog has been murdered uh, with a garden fork. And so he goes out and decides to solve the mystery of who killed the dog. And so he, you know, it's coming of age story. Uh, what I really love about the play is to me, it's, it's really about growing up and it's about acceptance and kind of learning how it's our experiences mm -hmm. that make us who we are and going out of our comfort zone and dealing with our own interferences mm -hmm. is where true change and growth can happen. Frightening. Yeah. But there's there's stuff that can come from that. So I love the fact that we're doing a show about someone who is neurodivergent. Mm -hmm. And um, how does that impact the way you direct the show? What, I, what are, you know, you have to be sensitive that you're not overdoing it or being true, right. true, right? Yeah, so coincidentally, I, I had the opportunity just on Sunday, uh -huh. uh, the same day I found about the actor, uh, Sunday, I had the pleasure of meeting with some special special education teachers and oh. therapists okay. uh, to talk about this because, right. you know, there's a lot of terminology and I wanted to make sure I'm not starting from scratch, right? And I wanted to come in with talking to the cast about this is the type of terminology we're looking at using. I'm not an expert at all. I'm, try right. I'm learning, right? Sure. Uh, and so the biggest thing that I learned in terms of terminology is I've chosen for within our room, our environment, oh. is to use identity first, uh, meaning rather than saying, it would be saying I'm autistic versus person first, which is I have autism, right? So those are they're the two kind of both in the field uh, from what I was told, neither is necessarily right or wrong. Uh -huh. It goes to the same as like sexual preference, sexual right. gender right now, gender pronouns. Uh, so for this production, we're trying to use the language identity first. 
Uh, so Christopher is autistic rather than Christopher has Got autism. It. So it. that it's it's who he is, right. not something that he has, if that makes any sense. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so that's one thing that I had learned in working on that. Through meeting with them, I also learned about domains, uh, how you can, how pe uh, people are tested to see whether they have autism or are autistic. Mm -hmm. And the three domains are language, uh, social cues, and, oh no, uh, uh, it was something to do with physicality. Um, Reactions to things? Yeah, I think it was something like that. Of course, now I'm on the spot That's and okay. all, all these of things course. go, so forgive me. But if, it's you know, interesting, wrong. It's, it's interesting. I think, if, I love that the play, um, that the lead is mm -hmm. someone who is autistic, yes. right? And that, and that he wins in the end, yes. right? You know, and and I think that that a lot of people, well, and I think the world is changing though. But there's so many people who are on the spectrum from all different reasons who are extremely talented or extremely mm -hmm. intelligent or extremely, um, you know, I've just found out that Andy Warhol was probably. Oh. had some sort of neurodivergency. And I'm like, well, that makes sense because he was so quiet and so shy and, you know, out in public. But in his family, he was a little bit more comfortable. And, mm. and But he was kind of one-worded and didn't do well. And sure. social situations made him nervous, right? It was just certain things. But I think that doing a story like this gives gives place and... and, and elevates you know yeah I mean it shows we're all we're all human right we're all people yeah we right? all have our challenges we, we all, all have, have our, our obstacles. challenges and it's all kind of this play deals a lot with sensory and I th mm -hmm. find it interesting you brought up Warhol different right. and, you know the public scene versus parent scene because right. it's different probably sensory sure. that he's dealing with and like you know Christopher deals with there's sensory when he can get overwhelmed uh -huh. right and that causes him to panic and you know have to try and calm himself down versus there's also some physical things he has which is called uh, I believe stimming I could be wrong okay. so forgive me if I'm wrong on that but I think it's stimulating for sure. them physically because this is a sensory that allows uh, autistics to focus more so it's like two sides of the flip sides of the same coin well I'm anxious to see the show no so more than ever. Oh, good. And we're going to root on your lead, oh, whoever yeah. it is. He's going to be great. He is going to be great. Alex, yeah. And you know what? To me, whoever ends up in the role always is who was meant to be in that role. I love that. It always works out. Yeah. The people who are meant to be there will be there on opening night. Yeah. Right? It, Serendipity. It is. Yeah. It is. Well, Daniel, we wish you the best, and I'll, I'll be there it. rooting you on opening night and your lead. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Be sure to catch College Theater's production of Curious Incident opening March 2nd. For tickets or more information, please visit atthemac.org. Malevo is a thrilling percussive dance group from Argentina who recently wowed audiences on America's Got Talent All-Stars. Don't miss your chance to see them on the Mac stage on February 25th. Witness the dexterity and skill of Dublin Irish dance as they defy gravity. Wings, a Celtic celebration of dance, will be at the MAC on February 26th. Be sure to see the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime from College Theater, which runs March 2nd through March 19th. Explore the world through six award-winning international films during the MAC's free Global Flick series. Movies are on Wednesdays in February and March and feature COD faculty-led discussions after the show. For tickets and more information, visit atthemac.org. Stop by the box office or call 630-942-4000. I'm happy to welcome back Justin Witte, who's here to tell us more about the show currently on display at the Cleve Carney Museum of Art. Welcome, Justin. Oh, thanks for having me. Thank you. <laughs> thanks for coming to yeah, my no house. Yeah, no problem. So Good tell to see us, you. Tell <laughs> us about, we just saw each other. Um, tell us about uh, Edris Soto's show. So the, the show currently on display uh, at the Mackinac Art Center, the Cleve Carney Museum of Art, is by artist Edra Soto, mm -hmm. and it's called The Myth of Closure. So Edra Soto is a sculptor who lives in Chicago, and for a long time she's been doing a series of sculptures based on kind of the wrought iron uh, architectural gates and porous cinder blocks that are outside of homes commonly 
in Puerto Rico, where she's mm -hmm. from originally. Um, and embedded in these sculptures, which look kind of like screens that hang on the wall and freestand, mm -hmm. there's little uh, viewing holes that look into um, little illuminated photographs. And in the past, they've dealt with kind of the history in Puerto Rico. She has a piece up at the Whitney Museum in New York that's gotten a lot of attention that deals with Hurricane Maria. But our show's a little different because it's very personal. And the myth of closure for her is her trying to find closure for an event that's ongoing. And that's uh, her mother dealing with Alzheimer's, who that she's had to take care of in Puerto Rico. So as you approach the sculptures in the gallery and look through these view holes, you'll see pictures of her mother as a, as a younger woman when Edra was mm -hmm. a child. You see her childhood home, but you also see her older and infirmed and in bed. Um, and they take place in the different houses. The photos are from different houses and the works are named after different neighborhoods in Puerto Rico where Soto lived. So it becomes a very personal um, view into that life. But then you think about the name and there starts to be a lot of other meanings that come in that make it even more powerful. Obviously the myth of closure, meaning in an event like this, you look for closure, mm -hmm. but when you lose someone to Alzheimer's, they're still around, right? right? You, you, they've lost their memories and maybe loss of some of what you remember of them. But even, when they, but even when someone passes, there's not really closure because those moments, those peaks into the past, those views continue to exist. Mm -hmm. And if you further think about closure and the objects that she makes in the show, which are based on these gates and cement walls that are their purpose is to enclose, to protect your house, to separate it from the outside world. But at the same time, they're porous, and in the show you can come and look through them. So it becomes kind of a poetic way of pointing, there's really no way to block off these connections. The connections of an immigrant from the country they're from, from that past, a connections from anyone from their family or their history. Air and time and memory flows through those closures. So it's really, it's the myth of closure with Edra realizing that there it really is no closure to this experience, the loss of her mother, or the, the ongoing loss of her mother. Um, but there's really no closure from your experience, right, from your life. We, th we think we can put things in tight boxes and separate chapters or locations, but there's always gonna be that flowing back and forth. But so I it's saw a really the, so beautiful the, show. The, the, the iron gates are yeah. So you have that that um, first impression when you walk into the gallery. They're very large. That you're scale. like, yeah. look at these beautiful gates. You yeah. know, they're just kind of unusual gates, right, mm -hmm. with the curves and things. And then I think I went in there when it wasn't even open yet, like yeah. right before. And and then I'm like, where are these? And then somebody said, peek in the these little holes in the design of the metal gates. Yeah. You know. And to me, what I felt was, there, it's bright and bold and big mm -hmm. and the gates, right? And then you find the little peak holes within the iron design and you and it, it's almost like, to me, you're also peeking through the gate into the life of somebody else, right. you know, and into her past. Mm -hmm. And it's so intimate when you peek in, just the act of peeking in feels like you're doing something that's very, selective and secretive and intimate and private, private. right? Absolutely. I and love I, that. I think that's the idea of that closure, right? Because it's also the idea that those will keep others out, but you're able to, to see in, mm -hmm. and, and she's providing you that view. And that's through Just her generosity. Glimpse, right? Just a glimpse. And even when, and you probably came before the text was up, so you may not have known that background story, mm -hmm. but I think even then you, you start to get a sense because you see the same oh, woman sure. at different times. And to explain to people who haven't seen the show, um, they're monumentally scaled works mm -hmm. that replicate these gates, but they're actually made out of wood. Her husband, Dan Sullivan, is a very successful woodworker in Chicago. He's done stuff for the Art Center. He did work on the Free, he made, his company made the Frida Kahlo bed for the Frida oh, Kahlo wow. show. Oh, wow, okay. Um, and they are covered, some of them, in a texture, like uh -huh. a plaster texture, reminiscent of the interior of a lot of these homes in Puerto Rico. But then you notice around some of them, there's heart shapes, very mm -hmm. intentionally. Those are based on literal frames that Edra found when she was at school at the Art Institute. And she loves the idea of how a frame can change a picture, but also 
It's the idea of framing an experience. Sure. And she's really presenting the show with love. I had a chance to talk to her during installation. Um, and I said, you know, what, what is it that drives you to, to make this body of work, this show? And um, she said, um, sadness. She said she had so much sadness from this experience mm -hmm. that she had to put it somewhere because she didn't know what to do with it. But it was also tied in with this love of her mother and her life. And it is a very loving show. So. <laughs> well, you know, I, I have a friend who, who, you know, I lost my mom, so I get it. And, mm -hmm. But I had a, a friend who he lost his mom to Alzheimer's. Yeah. But it was a long, slow, yeah. slow process. And when she passed, and I was like, I'm so sorry. And he goes, I feel like I lost her a long time ago yeah. because she's not who she was. You know, she just wasn't who she was anymore. And it's such a, a horrible, hard thing to go through. It's you cruel. know, to it is yeah. cruel for all involved, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're they're not the same person, but yet you have this love and memory and empathy and you want to you need to and want to take care of them more. You know, it's mm -hmm. just hard. And so um, I think it's there's so many people that can relate to it on so many levels and you know she is an amazing artist and I think it's pretty exciting that we have her here because it's Absolutely. she's just blown up she's been you know just in the past two her months been featured in New York Times twice you know she was just featured in a fashion magazine New City did a big piece and she's the sweetest person and what I would say to what you were saying is the beauty and kind of um, uh, uplifting aspect of the show is that despite the cruelty of that disease there's also no closure on that history right and she lives on through that history and so for anyone dealing with loss that experience doesn't go away that person doesn't go away so we are having an opening this weekend okay um, uh, I, I don't know when this is gonna air though that's okay because <laughs> the show goes on yeah. all the way through next. It goes through, through March fifth, yeah. so everybody can come and see it and and really do come see it because this might be one of those artists that you can say, I saw Absolutely. her show when. Absolutely. I mean, this is truly one of those artists. She's really magnificent and and it's sensitive and it's heartfelt and it's beautiful and it's accessible to anybody. Yeah, you should check it out. All right, thank you, Justin. All right, thanks for having me. Be sure to stop by the CCMA for this beautiful exhibition by Edra Zotto, open now through March 5th. For more information, visit the CCMA.org. And now I am going to go off script because I want to celebrate and thank the director of Backstage Buzz for the past several years. Um, Mr. Paul Thompson, and this is his last backstage buzz because he is leaving us at COD, COD to retire after 32 amazing years. Um, and Paul, will you come please be my special surprise guest? So Paul is the reason that the Mac was able to be successful all through the pandemic. If we didn't have this team, the multimedia team here at COD, we truly would have had to just go dark. But Paul has a special gift for music. And I had this idea of, can we do New Philharmonic outside, in the snow, in the cold, with instrument masks, microphones, and cameras um, to keep the music playing and keep the orchestra going. And Paul helped us figure it out. So for that, I am forever indebted and grateful. My other favorite memory of you is when we did, during the pandemic, when we had to do, we had to turn our gala inside out and do it online. And Paul directed that and it was awesome. And many people told me, it's the best gala they ever attended. And we went downtown and shot, and we did live stream and tape things. And, and Paul is truly a pro. And after 32 years, it's time you get in front of the camera. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's been fun, fun uh, many years here, working at the college and working for you and all the music stuff and the 
you know, um, art stuff and everything at the Mac does. It's been, and you uh, don't just do our stuff, you do everybody at the college stuff. Yeah, I do. Along with this whole team. Yeah, yeah, we, we have a great team here. You, you know. really do. It's been really special. So Paul, in all these years, you have to have a really good story. What's the craziest thing that ever happened? Oh boy. What was that? Oh, okay, I'll tell that one because everybody loves this. So we have a, our department is mostly men, and um, they're really hockey things. So the first year that we went to nationals, the college went to nationals. Mm -hmm. um, I went there to shoot um, the uh, game, and I stayed, you know, till the the half time I thought and then I left I left and I and we were ahead and I thought we won that was great so I went and you know I talked to you know the sports information director here at the college and said hey we won nationals he goes no we didn't we lost I didn't know there was three periods in hockey oh no I thought it was a first half and a you know second half so you just quit filming after the second I quit half? filming now I had all the highlights but um you know um I wondered why everybody was like leaving this you know the the hockey you know, arena after the second period you know you know nobody was whoop, whooping it up or anything so you know that's pretty funny you make mistakes well we all live and learn um so any big exciting plans uh, I plan to do some music stuff yeah. uh, that I do um, and uh, plan to stay working, doing some video, freelancing and stuff like that and, um, and doing some traveling. Good for you. You know, Paul, you've won some Emmys, haven't you? Uh, some awards, yes. We've Can you talk awards. about some of those that you won while you've been here? Oh, I just won some tele awards for some different programs and stuff like that. I mean, You're way you too know. modest. No, 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 no. I'm just, you know. We all have we all have done excelled in a lot of uh, areas here. So, uh, I'm what part I of the think team. that your gift is, though, you really have a gift for music and for directing cameras and cutting and the right. And if it weren't for you, I mean, you made our shows look like PBS specials. I mean, they were spectacular. And the problem with it is, all of the new Philharmonic audience is like, can't you still keep doing them? They want to do, mm -hmm. but they still love them because they got mm -hmm. to see the the musicians close up. Sure, sure. You know, and the emotions. And they're a, they're really good orchestra too. That's they really the, are a good orchestra, yeah. but we couldn't be more grateful. And on behalf of everybody on this amazing team, we just want to wish you the best and say thank you. Thank you for 32 amazing I, years. I appreciate it, and I'll have some people to talk to after this is over. <laughs> when you got this going here, got me under the seat. I like to be behind the camera. I know, but yeah. we, we felt like, you know what? Sure. You needed to be honored. Okay, thank you. Thank you.